Well, good morning, Calvary. Welcome this morning. For those of you that are in the atrium, we invite you to come in and join us. Um, I want to have a, a moment where I share something with you that is a great celebration of answered prayer after 50 years. We serve a God who is all-knowing and who is present everywhere. And we live in a world today that denies that. They deny the sovereign reign of one God as true God. And yet, that same God who is all-knowing, who is ever-present in all places, says in Psalm 139, For you formed, we give honor to God for forming our inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. There is no greater declaration of the sanctity of human life from the moment of conception than what God's word says because God created it and God ordained it. And now our country has decided finally that our Constitution of the United States supports the sanctity of human life. Now we praise God for that. Now we must be in prayer for all of the states that will be in tremendous battles over whether or not they will support the Constitution of the United States. And let us be in prayer for that right now. Our Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts today. 
that we have seen an answer to prayer that many of us have been praying for 50 years. And we thank you that the law has been stated clearly that our Constitution protects what God declares, and that is that all human life from the moment of conception has worth and value, and that would be murder to destroy it. And we thank you now for how you're going to continue to work in the hearts and minds of our own state of Wisconsin legislators, senators, and governors. Those people, Lord, who are antagonistic against a true belief in God. Those people who claim a social impact as being more significant than the truth of your word. And we pray, Lord, that you will use whatever means are necessary to soften their hearts so that in this state, and in fact in all 50 states, there would be a return to the truth of God declaring the sanctity of human life. And let it happen before you come back, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand. In Psalm 145, verses 18 through 20, we read this. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Let us make a shout of joy in the house of the Lord today. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. Amen. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolled the stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, Amen. and we won't be quiet. No, we're going to 
be seated. Uh, a couple of announcements to give you an idea of some of the things that are going on in ministry around this uh, place. Uh, next Sunday will be our monthly fellowship breakfast here at the church, so plan to come by 9.30, uh, and we will uh, have fellowship time. Uh, you are responsible, remember, for bringing the breakfast treats that you want to share with everybody, donuts and and whatever else you can think of uh, for breakfast treats. Fruit bowls will be fine. Uh, for those of you health nuts, that'd be fine. Uh, so, But we're also going to have a big cake because we're going to be celebrating next week uh, and honoring Sheldon Moss, who is officially retiring. This week is his last week as an official janitorial employee of Calvary for all of these years, and years and years before that in his previous churches. Uh, Sheldon has been an amazing servant of God, and we're going to honor him next Sunday morning. So you plan to come and uh, be a part of that celebration. How many kids went to camp last week? Raise your hand. There's one, Ari. There's another one back there, and I don't know where. Oh, there she is. There she is. Three girls went to camp last week. Was it good? <laughs> Two kind of excited yes, and one kind of eh, yeah. <laughs> I know they were all excited to be there, and they all followed my advice, and no one came home with a boyfriend. Right? That's good. Now, today we have junior high boys and girls that are going. How many of you boys and girls are going to junior high camp today? Stand up if you're going. Stand up if you're going. Boys and girls. Liam must be in the back, huh? There's only a few that are going. All right. Let's pray for them right now. Father, thank you for the kids that are going to camp. And I know James is going to pray for them later too, but uh, I just am so excited because I love camp ministry. And thank you for the hearts that are going to be changed because of what you're going to do. Amen. VBS this last week. Wow, what a recap. We had tons of kids here. Every year we have an offering contest and a special ministry. This year's special ministry emphasis for the offering was the Apple Pregnancy Care Center. And uh, you can be praying for them, as James will mention later, to be praying for them so that there is no... Uh, uh, hard things going on against them because of the ruling recently by the Supreme Court. But we raised $613.16. And just so everybody knows, the boys won the contest. And because the boys won the contest... Miss Amanda got to be silly stringed. That's pretty exciting stuff, huh? Uh, and many of you got to see the video that was a recap of VBS Week that was playing before the service. Uh, that'll be available on our website uh, this week so that you can look at it again and just see your kids in action. Thank you for what you give to this church, to the Lord's ministry, so that we can do things like this and keep the gospel going forward. Let's pray with thankful hearts right now for the giving that we're all going to do. 
Father, thank you so much that you are a God who gives. You gave your only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him would never perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for teaching us how to be sacrificial in giving by your Son sacrificing his life for us. And we pray that you will give us that kind of spirit in our management of our resources. That what we can do for the kingdom of God always comes first. Even when it requires a sacrifice of other things we want, we give to you because you first gave to us. Not to try to repay you, but to honor you with thanksgiving. And we do that in our gifts today for the glory of Jesus. Amen. To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me and Walk with him For all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with Him. The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear, and in the end we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. Oh, there will be a day when all will bow before Him. will be no more standing face to face when you died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and on that voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the one voice, a thousand generations, sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for that life that is beyond the grave. <laughs> now one day we will see you face to face, Jesus. We will be in your presence, Jesus. All pain will be gone. All hurt, all struggles will be gone in the presence of you, Jesus, our Savior. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> the former things shall all pass away. No more tears. Praise you, Jesus. And one day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question resolved, every anxious thought, every anxious thought left behind, no more fear, praise you Jesus, when we all get to heaven, what a day. Sing and shout the victory 
We'll sing and we'll shout the victory. Oh, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. to never have sailor time to be just request after request after request. So I'm going to have some praise time. And VBS was a great success, um, not only just because of the fun the children had, but the gospel was presented. And even I heard one student say, I can't wait to tell my parents so they can learn about Jesus too. And so amen. Also, the middle school campers came back. Some of them came back from last week being at camp. And this week, we have another bunch that is going. And so we can pray for them to just have time away from devices and time away from the Wi-Fi connection and just be connected with Almighty God. We also have a couple of prayer requests for health concerns. Um, Paul Valentine's uncle, 
Uh, they haven't been able to figure out what's wrong with his throat, and he's in the hospital, so we could be praying for him. And then also Kathy Holloman had um, taken a fall, and she has some severe bruising. We can be thankful that she didn't hurt her back anymore. Um, and then she also has a friend that has COVID. And then there's been a bunch of requests for the missionaries, and they'll be coming out in the email updates. But just to whet, whet your appetite here, um, we can be praying for the Apple Pregnancy Care Center after um, last Friday's ruling. Um, there's probably greater threats, and there's um, talks of protests, so we can just pray for them to have um, safety and to continue to minister. And then also Barb Bennett, um, she's a missionary to Rwanda with her husband Gary. They were actually supposed to fly back to Rwanda today, um, but with some medical clearance that she was doing from her knee surgery, um, it was determined she needs another surgery. So just pray for them um, to find location of housing and just the surgery to be done um, so that they can return to the mission field. And for those that are already on the mission field, you know, when you're expecting someone to come back and then they don't come back, it continues to um, have that greater responsibility on them. So pray for them as well. I'll give us a few minutes here and then I'll close us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that as I was praying, this you prompted that those who labor unto the Lord do not labor in vain. And we thank you for the missionaries that have labored unto you. We thank you for even VBS and Miss Amanda and the other volunteers that are probably tired after a week. Lord, we thank you that this laboring is not in vain. And we just now pray that um, you will just be amongst us and that we will just trust you more and more each and every day. Thank you for your servant, Pastor Josh, and just him bringing your word. And may we have receptive hearts uh, to know what you have called us to do. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Good morning. It is so great to be here today to worship with all of you and to study God's word. We're going to continue in our Genesis series. We are in chapter 16, and I know that some of you are going, we are almost done with June. You said we were going to get through all of Genesis this summer. We are. We are. Okay, we're going to, we're going to hit a few chapters at a time coming up very soon. But last week we talked about the covenant that God signed with Abram. And it was strictly God who signed it because it's not up to man to accomplish anything. It is all the work of God. Today we move into chapter 16. There are some commentators that I discovered this week that wish chapter 16 didn't exist. Not in a like throw away parts of the Bible type of way, but we have chapter 15 with Abram, a man of faith who is doing great things and he's in a covenant with God and then chapter 16 goes right into his failures. Yeah, pretty rough. Um, but today, let's look and see what we can learn because there is some really intimate personal things that we can learn from chapter 16. Before we dive into that, Let's talk about what else is happening around the world at this time. At this time uh, of chapter 16 of Genesis, we discover that elsewhere, the great pyramids are being built. This is actually a controversial topic because many secular scientists will say that the pyramids disprove Noah's flood. But simply put, the pyramids were built after the flood. When you study and you dig down under the pyramids, you discover that they are built on top of many fossil layers that can only be described or possible by the great flood. So don't let secular dating determine whether or not the flood happened. The flood did happen. The pyramids came after it. It is not God's word that's wrong. It is man's understanding of it that is wrong. So uh, trust the fact that these Pyramids were built after the flood, but those pyramids are being built around this time. 
Other parts of the world are being established, and the silk industry is actually being started and established at this same time. To give you more of a biblical understanding of when this chapter 16 is taking place, uh, it's 10 years after God has promised to Abram that he will have many descendants. 10 years, and still nothing has happened on those lines. So you'll get a better understanding of what's about to happen. We are going to break chapter 16 into three sections of reading today. If you don't mind the up and down and up and down and up and down, it's good medically. You won't get blood clots. Uh, you can stand as we read. If you don't like the up and down, just have a reverent heart before the Lord as we read his word. We're going to start by reading chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her. And she fled from her. You may be seated. Our first reaction to think, or uh, when we read this, is to think, what a mess. But you should be well trained by now after we've studied Genesis and we've studied mankind. Mankind always makes a mess, don't they? So the first thing I want you to recognize here is that mankind makes a mess. It's no surprise. The details are graphic, and we don't want to think about the man of faith, Abram, in this way. But mankind makes a mess. So many times what we do is when we think of, of men of faith from Scripture or women of faith from Scripture, we place them up on this pedestal, and then our expectations is that they do everything perfectly. And then we read something like this, and we go, Whoa, wait a minute, I thought you were perfect, and it knocks them down, and we go, what is wrong with this person? But we're the ones who elevated them in the first place. This is just mankind who is sinful, who will do sinful things, but we make a mess of it, and who gets to clean it up? God is always working, and we're going to get to that. But what I want you to see is the relatability of Abram here. Here's a man of faith who shows unbelief. Can anyone relate to that? Aren't you a person of faith, but yet you have areas where you show unbelief? So Abram is relatable. The believing the Lord that we saw in chapter 15, verse 6, where it says, and he believed the Lord, now he dismisses that momentarily and circumstantially, and he listens to his wife's bad idea. Sarai had a bad idea. And what he does here is his walk with the Lord, he kind of takes steps off of that path, and he does things according to the flesh. We all can relate. So don't look at him as some horrible person. Look at him as a person that we can find commonality with. We do it. It's not acceptable, but we do it. But what I want you to see from these first six verses is a few things. One of them, obviously, is mankind makes a mess because what we see here is that Sarai, Abram's husband, or Abram's wife, so by the way, Abram and Sarai will have new names later on. She'll be called Sarah it won't rub you the wrong way because Sarai is weird to say. But we're going to say it because that's what Scripture says. So eventually we'll call them Abraham and Sarah. But right now, Sarai trusts that God is sovereign. Notice what she says right away in verses 1 and 2. She says, the Lord prevented me from bearing children. So in a moment, she trusts that God is sovereign. She says, he's the one responsible for whether or not I conceive. I know that he is sovereign over childbearing. But in the next breath, she doesn't trust his timing. It hasn't happened yet. It's been 10 years. 
he hasn't done anything for us. Can we relate to that? We have a tendency to think that we can categorically trust God, but then circumstantially we cannot trust him. Or situationally, we know as a whole, I trust that God is sovereign, but in this category here, I don't think he's pulling his weight. There must be something wrong. And that's what Sarai did. She fell prey to that thinking. And so she didn't trust his timing. You have to remember that God's delay does not necessarily mean his denial for that request or his denial that it's going to happen. He had made a promise. He told Abram about it many times. He walked through those animal carcasses as a seal of his word. And yet they go, wait a minute. I know God's sovereign, but he's not doing it in the timing that I understand. So just because there's a, a, a delay doesn't mean that God is denying his promise. They took matters into their own hands. They decided to not understand what we will now see in Proverbs 3 when it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding or your own timing, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. That's how we see it from Proverbs, but we get caught in not fleshing that out too. We don't trust him in all of his wisdom. We lean on our own. And then we would do things just like Sarai did and suggest, let's do something about this. Warren Wearsby says, a willingness to wait on the Lord is another evidence that you are walking by faith. If you're willing to wait, if you are willing to be patient on him. So just so that you understand what's happening here, they were not, they, they had not had a child yet, Abram and Sarai. They thought that they would culturally decide what was normal in culture and have a servant or a slave or a concubine become another wife to bear a child. And by custom, this child would not be considered Abram and Hagar's child it would fully be considered Abram and Sarai's child. She basically births the child but has no right. So that's what is happening here in the first six verses. But we also notice this wasn't just on Sarai for having this horrible idea. Abram didn't stand in faith either. He didn't lead his wife in the commands of the Lord. He didn't lead her and redirect her back to the truth of what God had already established. He took her advice that advice led to sin against his own marriage and against the holy God who had established what marriage was supposed to be. You see, for both of them, time made them doubt the promise of God. Is anyone here really skilled at being patient? Maybe there's a few of you. Some of you are emphatically shaking your heads no. You can relate. Ten years. I've waited ten years for this, Abram and Sarai are saying. We better do something about it. We must have missed part of that detail of that command where we were supposed to make this happen on our own. But what we see is that it was actually time that made them doubt the promise of God. God is never out of the picture. He never forgets about his promise. He doesn't dismiss his plans when he has them. So they were doubting God because they had seen this time pass. And so that same time that had gone by not only caused doubt, but it caused them to dismiss the command of God. The command of God was that they were to uphold what marriage was supposed to be. And they, thought, they saw this time go by and they said, well, we can make an exception now. Because 10 years, there's got to be something wrong. We're going to do what culture says is okay. So they dismissed the command of God. They chose these cultural norms as truth, taking a concubine or a slave wife. You see, Sarai would always be considered the primary wife by the cultural standards, but it doesn't matter what culture said because it completely conflicts with God's design. It isn't allowed in the plan of God. We know this because we studied Genesis 2.24 where it says, hold fast to your wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Can't hold fast to your wife if you have someone else. You can't have two become one flesh when you bring a third in. It is against what God has already established. 
God did not approve of multiple wives. So often we see in Scripture, all of these people had multiple wives, and some had hundreds of wives. And we go, how could God ever approve of that? God doesn't approve of that. Mankind stretched the definition to fit self. And this is the start of what we see happening. We see that something doesn't sit right with mankind, so I'm going to take God's truth and I'm going to stretch it to include what I want, so I will take a wife and she gives me a child. Now all is happy, right? Because the result is that I got what I wanted. But it was time It was God's time that they didn't trust. He's already established this. He didn't approve of multiple wives. He didn't approve of this thing. But God certainly is not suddenly taken by surprise. And it suddenly doesn't take his power away to work through it. Because we're going to see that he does work through this. But in addition to time making them dismiss the command, we see that the result of this meeting between Hagar and Abram, this result made Sarah doubt the promise of God. Look at verse 4. It says, when when Sarai, or when Hagar realized that she had conceived, she developed these feelings toward Sarai. But what does that do if you're a woman? Where do you place the blame suddenly if you hadn't had children for 10 years of trying? And suddenly, here comes Hagar. She gets pregnant. What does that do to you? Who do you blame? Yourself, right? What's the common factor? Sarai. Can't have children. This whole thing is my fault. I've let my husband down. I've let God down. And suddenly the weight of all of it is coming onto her. She takes the results as an indication of whether it was right or wrong. And the doubt of herself was overpowering. And then in addition to that, Hagar decides to cop an attitude, right? She starts to look at Sarai with contempt, and that just adds to the weight of all of it. The results are not an indication of right or wrong. God's standard, what he has already declared, is an indication of right and wrong. And he said to Abram and Sarai, you will have descendants. I will make it happen. They strayed from that. And suddenly we have all of these emotions And these hurts. And it caused Sarai to erupt with emotion and blame her husband. She says, may the wrong be done to me beyond you. Now, to some degree, that's true. He wasn't a leader. He didn't redirect the situation to the truth of God. But she is still reacting poorly and emotionally and hurt. And all of this weight on her. And she blames her husband and says, this is all of your fault. She passed the blame She even calls upon upon God when she says, may the Lord judge between you and me. She goes over Abram's head and she goes, you know what, this is your fault and may God take care of this on you. She's emotional, she's hurt, she's reacting. But emotions also made Abram give in to Sarai's emotions as a husband. On one hand, Abram didn't cling to Hagar as his new prized wife. He chose Sarai over her But he looks at her in this situation when she's not reacting correctly, she's angry, she's upset, she's hurt, and what does Abram say? Do as you please. She's yours, do as you please. Who in here makes a good decision when they're overwhelmed, emotionally angry, upset? Anybody? You make a good decision when that happens? Patty is unique because none of the rest of us do. Right? It's foolishness that happens when we're boiling up and we're angry and we're upset and it's personal and all of a sudden we're going, what I was really equipped to do by God, which is bear children, I can't do it and now suddenly everything is my fault and Abram says, all right, you're in a good position to judge her. No, that was a horrible decision and emotions led both of them down this path of continued sin and bad decisions. And then we see that Sarai deals harshly with her. We don't know exactly what that means. It doesn't tell us how she exactly treated her, but we do know that it was poor enough that Hagar decides that she wants to run away. Newly pregnant to a rich man, right? Abram, 
wow, I'm carrying his child, but this situation is so horrible that all I can do is run away. No one understands me. No one sees what I'm going through. All they're doing is treating me like dirt, and I just want to run away. But at the same time, she has this prideful view of herself. She says, I'm better than that. I'm better than you, Sarai. I'm the one who got pregnant. And she looks on her with contempt. So she has this lofty view of herself. She forgets the position that she's in as a slave or as a servant in the household. In our pride, we do all sorts of emotional and foolish things. Sarai responded because her pride was wounded. Hagar ran because her pride didn't match her treatment. And this whole thing developed in these first six verses into a huge family mess. Anybody have a family mess? Yep. Not, that wasn't personal. <laughs> we all have messes in our family, don't we? And this is no different. It turned into this huge family mess. Hagar has lost her home. Sarai has lost her maid. And Abram has lost, or has, now has a son, Ishmael, who is out on the road because Hagar ran away. So that's what the first six verses say. We're going to read verses 7 through 12 now, and I want you to see the shift in the story. Everything is a disaster. Feelings are hurt. Emotions are high. People are doing things that they shouldn't do. Let's see what happens as we pick it up in verse 7. Remember, verse 6 ends with Hagar fleeing, running away. And now we find in verse 7, The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be, out, be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. You may be seated. On a side note, real quick, if you're a fan of music and you love where songs originated and things like that, you can see in verse 8 where we get the song, Cotton Eye Joe. Because the angel of the Lord said, where have you come from and where are you going? That's just a bonus clip for you today. What we see here, which is not identified until, until verse 13, is a brand new name for God. But I wanted to bring it in, into play here in verses 7 through 12 because the whole situation encompasses this new name. The new name that's identified by Hagar in verse 13 is a result of how God is working starting in verse 7. And that new name is El Roi. It means the God who sees. He is a God of seeing. Him who looks after me. And so 7 through 12 shows us what leads her to this idea, to call him this new title. He is a God of seeing. And so what we see is that man makes a mess, but God works through this mess. You see, Hagar was in despair. She was hopeless, weary, alone, a woman in a male-dominated culture. She was pregnant, rejected, cast out after being used, and surely she feels like nobody cares for her. No one understands her. We see in Psalm 34, 18 that it says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That was her, brokenhearted and crushed. And what do we see? We see that the angel of the Lord pursued her. You see what it says in verse 7? He found her. He found her. She was on the run. She was heartbroken and desperate. And the angel of the Lord found her and appeared. Now this is the very first time that we see this term, the angel of the Lord, with Lord being all capitalized. It's the first time that it shows up. And commonly this is attributed to a pre-incarnate Jesus appearing. 
The reason many people think this, the main reason, is that this term never appears again after the incarnation of Jesus. He's occupied, right? It appears in the Old Testament at times where people are in great distress, this being the first of many. You see, one thing that we can understand is that Jesus, if we look at his life on earth and his ministry, he dealt personally with people's greatest distress. He dealt with the penalty for sin, man's biggest distress. How am I going to do this? How am I going to make myself right with God? I can't. Jesus came and he took care of that. At a minimum, what we know about the angel of the Lord, without making any sort of assumptions or disagreements, we see that God is here in a very distinct way. In his identity as Most High, he is still interacting personally with mankind. This figure, the angel of the Lord, allows us to understand the complexity of God, that it is one God in three persons. And it helps us see that it's possible for Jesus to be both one with the Father, but yet God's Son that we see in John 10. And so we have Hagar in her pride and her misery. She ran without really thinking about the details. But God cares for her. He directs her to think about what's happening. And so... While man makes a mess, God works through it, and we see him appear in the midst of chaos. This single mother on the run due to her pride and being mistreated by the one who came up with this whole idea in the first place, she was distraught, and we see that the angel of the Lord appeared to her in the midst of chaos. And not only that, he directed her in the midst of chaos. Psalm 32, 8 and 9 tells us that God teaches you in the way that you should go. And that's exactly what he was doing. He didn't abandon her. He didn't just show up to make an appearance. He says, I'm going to get personal with you and I'm going to direct you. He tells her, return to your mistress. So he's giving her guidance. He also gives hope in the midst of chaos. Here she is wondering what's going to become of her and her child. And what does the angel of the Lord promise? I will surely multiply your offspring. You see, only God can do that. Only God can multiply descendants. And so he gives her reason to hold her head up and have hope in what's to come. He promises Ishmael and promises that she will be okay and have many descendants. You see, the descendants of Ishmael would settle in the northern Arabian Peninsula, not all of the inhabitants of that peninsula now are descendants of Ishmael, but that's where they, dis that's where they um, settled. They're called Arabs. They are a warlike people. In Genesis 25, 18, Ishmael's descendants are described as living in hostility toward all the tribe that related to them. And even today, Arabs have more hostility and violence between each other than any other group because Scripture said that's exactly what was going to happen. They will live in conflict with each other, and all of your brothers and tribes that of, of like mind are going to be against each other with fighting. But in the midst of that chaos, he gives Hagar hope. He also knows the details. He tells her, you are pregnant. Behold, you are pregnant. Now, she already knew that, but isn't it nice to have someone identify with the details when you're going through something tough? Isn't it comforting to have God in the midst of all of that chaos tell you that he knows the details? He knows the garbage that surrounds your family chaos? He knows intimately what's going on? Why is that so refreshing? Because he's right there next to you. That chaos and that garbage didn't make him run off. He pursued her. He put his arm around her and he said, I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to take care of you. It didn't scare him off. It brought him close. And he said, I'm the one who is equipped to handle all of this because I'm the God who sees. I see you, Hagar. I know everything about you. You're pregnant. You've run away. What are you doing? I'm going to give you guidance. I'm going to give you comfort. He knows all of the details, and he hears the pain. Did you see in verse 11, the Lord has listened to your affliction. This isn't a big deal if you put God down here, right? It's not important that God listens to you if God is just this little God to you. 
But when you understand what we're beginning to understand more and more every week, that God is the most high, the sovereign God over everything, the creator, he listens to you. He knows your affliction. You are not alone. He sees you, no matter what the topic is. Do you understand that Hagar just slept with Abram and got pregnant against the very standard of God and who's right there with her to help her and show love to her and comfort her and pursue her. It's God himself. That's the mighty God that we serve. He hears your pain. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. And here's Hagar going, I have nowhere to turn. I need to take refuge in you. And he says, Welcome. Because that's the kind of God he is. The name Ishmael means God will hear or God hears. What a powerful detail. God hears you when you don't think anyone can. But then we're going to see in verses 13 through 16 that we're going to read the whole point of this name, El Roy. Would you please stand for verses 13 through 16? And so here's Hagar after this interaction with the angel of the Lord. After she realizes how personal and amazing this God is, she says, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Ber Lahai Roi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. You may be seated. Just a quick note before we get into that name. You see that Hagar listened to God. The angel of the Lord said, return. She obviously returned because Abram knew what to name his son, Ishmael. So she obeyed. In spite of all of the chaos, she once again decided, I'm going to trust in this almighty God. And so one thing that I want you to see from all of this is that God sees you in the mess. The name of that well, that well means well of the living one who sees me. The God of all of the universe sees you. You see, the idea surrounding this name it's not that God sees you and is spying on you or he's lurking around just waiting to jump out and accuse you of something that you're doing. That's not the context of that name. The context of this name is that in the midst of all of the chaos, in the midst of the sin, in the midst of the problems, Almighty God in his splendor and majesty, he sees you. He cares for you. That is the God that we serve. You see, he watches over all of his children all of the time. He never stops. No matter what you're doing, no matter what garbage you think you have in your life, no matter how alone you think you are, God never stops caring for his children. He sees you all the time. We have this desire to be seen. There is this joy that comes over us when we're seen in our own context, some of you are introverts and you don't want to be seen at all, right? And some of you think it's a struggle to be here, and I get that. You, you want to get out quickly. I'm glad you're here. But we have this desire to be seen, and it's really illustrated with kids. And at a sporting event, kids want to be seen. They want to look to the stands and know that the person they want to see them is sitting there. At a concert, at anything, you know the person that you want to see you. And I want you to watch this video of this small little class that illustrates this perfectly. Watch out, kid. There's a leg there. Oh, uh oh. Yep. Okay, now watch. Watch that little guy. The camera's going to follow him in the green. He's looking, doesn't see anyone. Boom. Look at that. All he cared about was the one person that he wanted to see him. And he, he has to get guided back to stay focused. What are you doing? Keep your eyes on what you're supposed to be doing. But now watch. Again, he's like, the person that I want to see me is here and they see me. And he's filled with joy. 
Think about Hagar. She thought that of all the people in the world, maybe she wanted Sarai to see her for the trouble that she was in and respect her and care for her. She thought that what she wanted was Abram to fight for her. And those things might have been nice, but they never would have been as meaningful as what actually happened where she's there on the run, in distress, feeling completely alone and unheard, and the angel of the Lord shows up. The one who can make everything right sees you. Are you filled with joy because the one who can make everything right never abandons his children. He pursues you in the mess. He works through the mess. He knows every detail of your mess and he still says, I love you. I am the God who sees and nothing can turn me off from looking at my children because I care for them. Do we jump up and down with excitement knowing today that God is the God who sees? You see, in, in the most painful trial that you have, you may too have an opportunity to see and have a most intimate and personal encounter with God. You see, Hagar's wilderness experience brought her face to face with God, and it taught her that the I am is the living God who sees our plight and he hears our cry when we hurt. He's a personal God. He's concerned for abused people. He's concerned for unborn babies. He knows our past and our future, and he cares for those who will trust him. You see, Billy Graham says this, it doesn't make any difference how far you've tried to run from God. He loves you. His eye is on you. He sees you. God created us in his image, and you, as a person, are important to God. So no matter where you find yourself today, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you feel overwhelmed about your children, your home, and your life. You feel like you need a break, but then immediately when you feel that, you feel guilty because you shouldn't need a break. Mothering is so wonderful and it should always refresh me. And so you're tired and you're guilty and you feel alone. Did you know that God sees you and he knows? Maybe you're a mom working outside the home and you're feeling tired because you work so hard, but then immediately you feel guilty because you're tired and you go, I'm supposed to have all these expectations of working and being a perfect mom. Did you know that God sees you? Middle school students who are going to camp, you're trying to figure out this crazy balance of friends and school and God and how important is Jesus to me and who is, what is my identity? You struggle with knowing if Jesus is really all that important or how it fits into this whole thing. What is life all about? Did you know that God sees you? God loves you. High school students, maybe you're feeling the pressure from parents to succeed. You're trying to figure out what you're going to do with school and life. But on the other hand, your parents don't seem to even trust you that you can make a smart decision. And so what is all of this chaos all about? Did you know that God sees you and he hears you? He knows you personally and he loves you. Maybe you're a man or a father. You're struggling with feeling respected at work and in the home. You desire what's best, but then some days you just lack the motivation or the encouragement to do it. You feel like you lack the skills to accomplish it. You're reminded all the time in your own mind about your weaknesses and then other people bring them up to you and you just, you feel like a failure. Did you know that God sees you too? No matter where you are, know that it isn't about you and who you think you are or the struggle you think you're going through or that you are going through. It's about the most high God, the one who is above all things in splendor and majesty. He cares for you. He sees you. He intimately wants you to know that he loves you and he pursues you. That is the God who sees That's what Hagar identified with this new word. And it's so powerful because it is the God of all of the universe who says, I see you and I send my son Jesus to you so that you don't have to die. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord over your life. That's the God that we're talking about. No matter what, he cares for you and he sees you. 
And like so many times, this study led me back to a familiar song by a group that I just love their lyrics, Casting Crowns. I want to read to you a section of this song as the team comes forward. The song goes like this. Who am I that the Lord of all of the earth would care to know my name, that he would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice who calmed the sea would call out through the rain and he would calm the storm in me? And it's not because of who I am, but because of what he's done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. He is the God who sees. He is the God who loves you and cares for you, and he wants to comfort you. And it's only possible through a relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior. So no matter what, if you have Jesus Christ, no matter what the storm is in your life, no matter what you're going through, not only does God see you and he cares about it, and you are not alone, but through it all, you can always say it is well with your soul because you have a Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we have this desire to be seen we have this desire to be heard, and at minimum today, we discovered that you, almighty, majestic, powerful God, you hear us in our affliction. You see us in our chaos. You know every detail. Your eyes look on our sin, but yet you work personally in our lives. God, you are not distant you are distant from the people that have not recognized Jesus Christ as Savior. You don't have, they don't have a relationship with you, but you are pursuing them. You are stirring in their heart today, and you are prompting them to say, I need Jesus as Savior. You want to be close to them, no matter what things they have going on, no matter how alone they feel, no matter how powerless they feel, no matter how rejected they feel. God, you are telling them this morning that Jesus is right there waiting for them that all of these things can be well with their soul because of Jesus Christ alone. If that's you today and you don't have Jesus Christ as Savior, and any of these feelings resonate with you, come forward. Come forward during this last song and make it once and for all well with your soul because of Jesus. And for the rest of you, would you sing a declaration that it is well with your soul because God is the one who sees, and you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Please stand. Grand earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all it is well It is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain that in front of me or will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is a
heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. The snares of death encompassed me, but he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I call on him as long as I live. Almighty God hears you and he sees you. Would you go today and live a life knowing that you are not alone? You have the God of the universe paying attention to you. You are dismissed. (laughs) 